I know you guys have been dying for me to do this, so here it is. I'm going to review Jeff Nippard's high intensity training experiment. Now I haven't even seen this video yet, mostly because I know what I'm about to see is going to be absolutely atrocious. So on one hand, it's a good thing that Jeff Nippard is finally realizing that high intensity training is superior to all other training methods, not for the sake of effectiveness, but for the sake of safety and efficiency. But on the other hand, I know he's going to do a very poor job demonstrating it. So I'm gonna watch through this video, I'm gonna see how it goes, and I'm going to comment and critique the plethora of mistakes I'm probably going to see. For days, I cut all my workouts in half. I wanted to see what would happen if I went from doing my usual three to four sets per exercise down to just one all-out set, sometimes two. Would I lose muscle? Right off the bat, <laughs> I noticed he said one all-out set sometimes two. Now, where have you heard that before? In terms of high intensity training advocates, I believe I'm the only one who says that. So I'm under the impression he kind of got this protocol from me. In this video, I'll break down exactly what I did, what the science says, and what happened to my physique. For as long as I've been training, I've always been a pretty high volume guy. For one, that's the way the bodybuilding greats like Arnold, Ronnie Coleman, and Jay Cutler all trained. And it's also what the science suggested was most optimal. So for me, it was kind of a no brainer. I generally do at least three to four sets on each and every exercise, every workout. But like I said, for the last 100 days, I flipped that completely. I became the lowest volume guy in the gym. Instead of three to four sets, I only did one or two sets. Now, one thing we need to realize is that not all sets are created equal. Volume is actually the amount of time the muscle is spent under meaningful load, not how many sets you do. So if you took a high volume workout, three to four sets per exercise, and you measured the amount of total time spent under meaningful load, and then you compared it to one of my high intensity training workouts with just one, maybe two sets, and compare the time under load done in my workout, you would find that the high intensity training workout I'm doing is actually more volume in terms of time under meaningful load. Now remember, it's not just time under load, because if you're lifting those little pink dumbbells, your muscles are technically under load, but it's meaningless. It's time under meaningful load, time under load that involves high effort. Per exercise, that's it. For several lifts, I just do one all out max effort set and move on. <sighs> so right off the bat again, that's not failure. <laughs> that is probably two or three reps in reserve. Granted, he's using a machine that it would be very difficult to achieve failure on safely, but that's not muscle failure. There's a difference between failure because your muscles fail and failure because you believe you're not going to be able to get the next repetition. You do not decide when the set is over when you're training to failure. Your muscles decide. Right here I'm seeing, he decided he was done. His muscles did not. Man. Now, to get everyone on the same page, when I say volume, I mean the total number of hard working sets that you do for a muscle each week. So if you do a large number of sets, you're doing a high volume program. If you do a small number of sets, you're doing a low volume program. So let's use our chest as an example. Let's say you hit your chest on two days, three sets of chest press on Monday and three sets of cable flies on Thursday. And that's all you do for the week. That means your weekly chest volume is six sets per week. And for the last decade or so, the standard science-based guideline for sets per muscle per week was, what do you think? It's about 10 to 20 sets per muscle per week. That's quite a lot. And again, here's the problem. Not all sets are created equal. If you are able to tolerate doing 20 sets per muscle group per week, chances are your sets are not very intense. There's an inverse relationship to intensity of effort and the amount of volume you can tolerate and recover from. Because here's the thing, the amount of time the weight goes up and down is meaningless. It's got nothing to do with stimulating optimal numbers or a high number of motor units. That is driven by intensity, that's driven by effort. Henneman size principle, we've known this for decades. So some people may see more benefit doing more sets because their sets are awful. And of course, that's just for one muscle. For your total body volume, you need to add up all the sets for all your other muscles too. Those are some long workouts. Trust me, I train like this for years, but not anymore. This is what my full week of chest training looks like now. Two sets of incline press and two sets of pec deck on Monday, 
two sets of machine chest press on Thursday. That's it, six sets per week. Let's use this graph to compare how my current volumes look compared to the standard science-based volumes. This is what the high end of the science range looks like. And this is what the low end of the science range looks like. And this is what I'm doing right now. So it's pretty freaking low across the board. Most of my muscles get six sets per week. Some get four sets per week, and a few are in the eight to 10 range. My shoulders get 10 sets, my back gets nine, my glutes get nine, and my quads get eight. On average, I'm only doing about six and a half sets per muscle per week. Now, even that is probably too high. I personally do one to two sets per muscle per week. And the reason is I attempt to get the absolute most stimulus out of that one set as humanly possible by knowing how to train to the point where your muscles fail, not when you fail. If you wanna learn more how to do this, I offer a coaching program. It actually takes several weeks to learn how to push your muscles to that level, but once you learn how to do it, you'll unlock way better muscle growth and you will save a lot of time in the gym. Now, as a beginner, it makes sense to do a little bit more because you're definitely not training as hard as you can and you should be. But if Jeff learned how to really take his sets to true muscle failure, he wouldn't even be able to tolerate six sets per week. And for the 100 day experiment, I split that volume up like this. Upper, lower, rest, upper, lower, arms, rest. And I repeated that split for 14 weeks. For the past 15 years, the research has been hammering the same message. Volume is king. Now, most of the research that showed volume was king didn't measure muscle growth. A lot of them measured muscle strength. And what did they use to measure muscle strength? Well, how much weight you can do on either bench, squat, deadlift, or movements that actually require technical skill. So as I've said in the past, if you're using a movement to test strength, individuals who practice that movement more through more sets, more frequency, more practice is going to equal better neurological adaptation and allow you to move more weight. That's why these studies are stupid. So keep in mind, a lot of those studies didn't even measure muscle growth. A lot of them measured strength and the way they tested muscle strength was wrong. Back in 2010, James Krieger published a meta-analysis of eight studies comparing one set versus two to three sets per exercise. And what he found was clear. Doing more sets caused more gains. Now, I personally have a problem with meta-analysis, and it's not because I'm trying to support my own beliefs. What a meta-analysis is, it looks at the results of a bunch of different studies that meet a particular criteria. And then they analyze the data from those studies. The problem with meta-analysis though, is the meta-analysis will inherit whatever flaws are included in that study. For instance, a lot of the studies could have been short of muscle failure. Some measures of muscle hypertrophy are not very accurate. And you gotta keep in mind too, I found some conflict of interest with some of these studies as well. For instance, Brad Schoenfeld was, or maybe even currently is, on the board, and he publishes his studies in the journal of the NSCA. Now, what is the stance of the NSCA on volume? Higher volume is better. So if Brad Schoenfeld came out and did a study and found low volume was potentially superior to high volume, that would kind of go against the recommendations of the board that he serves on. And another thing to note, when you actually look at the studies really closely and you look at the data, you'll see that while some of the studies do show more hypertrophy, the amount is so small that it's not anything you would ever notice in the mirror, on the scale, and it's barely measurable using the measurement tools that they use. So my question is this, for a 1% increase in muscle hypertrophy for an additional two, three, four, five hours in the gym per week, is it worth it? For most people, no. The main driver of hypertrophy within the science-based community. I was even singing its praises. Training volume, this has been cited as being the main driver of hypertrophy. But were we all kind of wrong? They were wrong, I wasn't. Last year, Pelland and colleagues dropped the biggest, most detailed meta-analysis on training volume that's ever been published by far. Now we're up from 15 to, get this, 35 studies on training volume for muscle growth. And this time, yeah, they found another super clear dose response relationship between volume and hypertrophy. More volume, more gains. But there are some issues. If you venture deep into the dingy underground corners of the online science-based lifting subculture, you'll find plenty of people criticizing this paper. You'll hear that none of these studies are actually measuring true muscle growth. What's really happening is all that high volume training is simply causing the muscle to swell up with blood and inflammation, something called edema. 
It's really just a big pump that lasts a few days, making it look like the subjects gained more muscle when the researchers measured it. I have been saying this for years. And any of my clients watching or people who've been following my channel watching, you've probably heard me say that a million times. Why is it taking Jeff Nippert so long to catch on to something a lot of us have been saying for almost a decade? And that's literally what happens. The more volume you do, the more microtrauma is inflicted on your muscle tissue and the more inflammation your muscle tissue experiences. Also, the more you're emptying your muscles of glycogen, there's gonna be a slight increase in the amount of glycogen your muscles will intake. And the more glycogen in your muscles, well, the thicker your fibers are. Because the size of your muscles is not solely based on the amount of contractile proteins in them. It's a combination of the contractile proteins, the glycogen, water. So when you're looking for true long-term improvements in muscle size, what you should be looking for is the expansion of the contractile protein pool because the size of your muscles will vary even on a day-to-day -day basis with differences in muscle swelling, inflammation, glycogen retention, and even hydration. But it's not the angle I'm taking, no. Instead, I'm going to criticize this literature through a much more practical lens. First, let's get this straight. These studies didn't apply high volumes to every muscle all at once. No, most of them just blasted their biceps and triceps or their quads with high volumes. And for the most part, all their other muscles were trained normally or not at all. So the best you can really say is that high volume works if you blast a single muscle or two. Even the authors note that doing high volume for your entire body could cause some serious recovery issues. That's a really good point. And I'm surprised Jeff Nipper caught on to this. A lot of the studies measuring volume with a muscle group are training only that muscle group. So they don't have the recovery challenges that a gym goer would have. Speaking of recovery, almost all of these studies were done at around maintenance calories. But what happens if you're in a caloric deficit like I am right now? A deficit means less energy, which means less recovery. So it's just not clear if these results apply when you're cutting. Perhaps most importantly though, all of these studies are short-term interventions. They usually only last six to 12 weeks. So what happens over a longer time frame, like a year or two? Do higher volumes keep pulling you ahead forever or do they just give you a short-term boost and lower volume training would eventually catch up as you get closer and closer to your natural limit? So while the literature might not show that in the long run, both lower volume and higher volume training lead you to the same destination, your genetic potential, well, there have been coaches and colleagues of mine who have been training people for several decades, monitoring their clients' results, monitoring the data that found higher volume, higher frequency lead you to the exact same destination in the long run, which is your genetic potential. Your genetics determine your outcome from exercise, no matter what protocol you do, no matter how much volume you do. But when I say genetics determine almost everything, I don't mean that people can't get tremendously good results and extremely impressive transformations doing the right program. Hundreds of my clients have completely transformed their physiques. What I'm saying is you may not end up looking like your favorite influencer or your favorite bodybuilder, because if you had the genetics to look like that, well, you'd already look like that right now. All of that is why I wanted to test this out for myself. I track my chest strength and my quad strength using a standardized science-based protocol. I track my physique with progress photos under the exact same lighting. And I track my body fat and lean mass with DEXA. For the challenge, I wrote the most effective low volume split I could think of. I knew from other research that if I was going low on volume, I needed to go ultra high on intensity. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, come on, come on, yeah! Nice! Oh, nice, God. dude. You got a little cheaty at the end, but... <laughs> that, guys, that's not muscle failure. Sure, it's intense. That's If that's more intense than everything he's been doing, then I'm sorry, Jeff, you probably weren't training very intensely at all. That is close to muscle failure, but it's not there. Jeff completed the repetition, lowered it, and said, wow, I think I'm done set it down, which you need a really good instructor to push you past that, which Jeff, I'd be happy to take you through a workout and show you what true high intensity training really is. Just message me. Jeff would have experienced a sensation in his muscles that he's never experienced before in his entire life, despite being an advanced trainee. And he would have experienced even more 
muscle growth. And if I took Jeff through a set to true muscle failure, even the mere thought of doing a second set would terrify him. And that is what it means to do high intensity training and one set to failure. So Jeff, if you're watching this video, which I'm sure you've watched some of my content in your journey to discovering high intensity training or actual science-based training, let's get together. Let's do a workout and I'll show you what real high intensity training is. So guys, that's it. That's Jeff Nippard's experiment with high intensity training. Looks like he got some great results, even though he actually did it suboptimally. You simply don't know what you don't know. Training to real muscle failure really does need to be taught. It needs to be instructed. And it takes a few weeks to learn. And it takes several weeks to actually learn and grasp it. And at this point, there really is just no denying the fact that high intensity training is a superior protocol. And I've noticed for most people, it provides better gains. It provides better improvements in muscular size and strength. But even if it didn't, the amount of time you're saving, an irreplaceable asset time, makes it superior for that reason alone. If you wanna learn about high intensity training and how to apply it properly, so you can maximize your gains in the gym and minimize the time you spend in there, I have a school group, click and you can join for free. And I post five to seven new videos every single day. You can ask questions on the forum and you can even send me direct messages with your own personal questions. So click that link below, join my school group and make yourself an expert too. Thanks for watching guys. Don't forget to hit the like, subscribe and the bell notification icon 